Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so welcome today to today's seminar. This is our, our School of Public and Community Health Sciences uh, regular seminar schedule 12 to 1. Um, we have a very special guest seminar uh, speakers coming in today from a long ways away. And this is uh, it's, uh, sponsored by the American and the Alaska Native Clinical Translational Research Program. That's a lot of the acronyms, A-I-A-N-C-T-R-P. And this is part of a program where we do a uh, faculty exchange where we send folks from Montana up to Alaska uh, to presentations to meet people. And then to bring folks from up there down here. And that's what uh, we have three of the finest Alaskans uh, with us today. There was a back um, so the way this is not just a regular one hour seminar, it's going to be more informal, I think, and it, it might last a little bit over an hour. I think we budgeted an hour and a half. And then afterwards, there's going to be a reception down in 166. So I give you more time to, to meet with our speakers and get to know them and hopefully build some research collaborations with them while they're here and find out some really cool places to go fishing in Alaska, which is what I want to find out. Um, <laughs> Couple things. We have some Zoom visitors. Uh, several folks on the phone or on the video from uh, that are watching remotely. So for those folks that are visiting remotely, hello. Hope you can hear us. And if you can't, just type in a message and we'll get, get to you. Um, and then I think we're recording this also, so folks later on can can watch this presentation and, uh, and you might get questions later on. So without uh, too much more of me um, going on, I'd like to introduce our speakers. So first off, we have uh, Stacy Rasmus. So Stacy is a research associate professor and interim director of the Center for Alaska Native Health Research, or CANR, uh, at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. She currently leads several NIH, NSF, and, and SAMHSA grants that engage AI, AM populations in research and evaluation initiatives to eliminate disparities in suicide and substance use disorders. Her most recent U19 award, uh, which was funded through the National Institute of Mental Health, has established Alaska Native Collaborative Hub for Research on Resilience, or ANCHOR. She also leads a newly awarded NARCH initiative that addresses the opioid crisis. Next up is, uh, is Jim Allen. So Jim is a uh, former Missoulian from way back. Um, and I learned a lot of really cool things about Missoula back in the day, so I'm going to follow up on that in a second. So Jim is a professor in the Department of Family Medicine and Biobehavioral Health and senior scientist with the Memory Keepers Medical Discovery Team for American Indian Rural Health Equity at the University of Minnesota Medical School, Duluth Campus. So previous to this, he was associate director at, of Canner and graduate faculty in the clinical community psychology program with indigenous and rural emphasis at UAF. His research interests include community resilience and in indigenous settings, prevention of Alaska Native and American Indian youth suicide and substance use risk, CBPR, multi-level intervention. And then we, we are super lucky to have Mr. Billy Charles with us today, who comes from us uh, or comes to us from a long ways away. Um, close to Nome, Alaska. So Billy's a Yupik Alaska Native shareholder and tribal member from the native village of Imanac, Alaska, population of almost a thousand. Um, as a research co I or co-investigator at UAS Canner, uh, Mr. Charles provides leadership, cultural direction, and intervention implementation of fidelity management for several projects, including Anchor. Mr. Charles is also a well-established tribal leader in his community, serving as the president uh, the Village Corporation at the state level serves as an elected member of the Alaska Federations of Natives. It's also a traditional Yupik song and dance leader in his communities and an active fisherman and subsistence hunter. So our sincerest welcome to the University of Montana, to, to Montana, uh, and to Missoula, and uh, take away. <laughs> Oyana, we took Siluta Mani, we could call the last food, that one I am going to 
First for the hospitality, the introduction. And uh, my father and the elders used to say that no matter where you go in the world, you can hear the teachings, the principles of our people. Mm -hmm. And I say this in your paper, hope that when I thank you, that my ancestors are looking over us and we bring the blessings to you for your kind of hospitality. And uh, I was looking at the uh, trying to find a theme around this one. And uh, uh, and I think, you know, from hearing some of the uh, discussions in the one on one, is that, you know, the importance of one mind, that culture, and I said, in that culture, in Sri Lanka, what we certainly do, that my elders and my father used to say, because because we're not thinking in one mind, many times we're trying to face these challenges. And so I hope this presentation will uh, kind of reflect on that and that uh, for the uh, many years of work that uh, my colleagues have been involved with. And um, maybe we'll hear about Stacy take over and introduce herself and uh, Jim that, or however, however you want to do it. But uh, I think I've been introduced, uh, you know, but, uh, I like to say the community where I'm from is about as far west as you can go. And from there, it goes east, either at east or <laughs> far east. <laughs> uh, Stacy, Dr. Stacy Rasmus, she's been with our community for a while. And, you know, I think that's what uh, brings uh, the success of our work because she's been involved in living in our community for a while. And, uh, I have the respect of our community. And uh, that longevity, I think, is a very important thing. You know, we both, both Dr. Stacy Rasmussen, Dr. Jamal, have done that in our communities. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Rihanna, really. I'm so honored to have this invitation to come visit this beautiful, these beautiful lands I'm just taken. And I think that the Native people of these lands for allowing us to come here and share about our work that, as Billy said, even though this is work we do and it seems very far away on the coast, the very coast of Alaska, it's, um, I think it's extra chairs too. Um, I hope you're gonna see a lot of similarities no matter where you come from and the work that we're gonna describe today um, when we're talking about how community, how Yupik communities um, in Alaska, um, you know, on the Bering Sea Coast, how they're working together to address you know, very, you know, very life and death issues that are that are happening in, in all of our communities, but that are facing communities um, in Billy's lands. Um, I hope you see that you know as we're talking about all of these strengths and protections that come from Yupik culture um, that reach out pull young people in and protect them, give them reasons for life, give them reasons to be healthy and sober and take care of themselves, that you're gonna see yourself in that. I certainly did when I first went to out to the Yupik communities nearly 20 years ago. Um, I was raised in the Pacific Northwest, but wasn't in my bio, um, is I was raised in Bellingham, Washington. My mother's family is Coast Salish. Um, uh, but I was raised by my father who's not native, I have a Vietnamese stepmother, and I didn't know that side of myself until I was a teenager and very much in need of making that connection. And I was very fortunate um, that I was able to make a connection that saved my life. And I know, <laughs> so I know, and I, I just decided then, like, okay, you know, this is this is what this is what saved me. So I want to give back for the rest of my life and, and work on creating more opportunities for young people, such as myself, to be able to gain those strengths. Um, but I've just, you know, I've been so fortunate. I kind of fell in love with the communities in Alaska. Alaska is, you know, feels like my home, is my home. Uh, but I do have the fortune to go down uh, states every single month. I still work with um, uh, my tribal communities in the Pacific Northwest on projects now that are focused on that would be a nice 
resources. I can talk about that if you'd like to talk more about that. I have materials and information, um, and that can be at the reception. Yeah, it's so great to be back. You know, many of you, a few of you know me from years and years ago, and you still invited me. So I'm just <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, I, I'm, I'm as well really honored to be back. I, I, I just want to say a couple of things. The first is by way of introducing this work, and uh, you know, we, um, in many ways, in many ways, this is not the researcher's work. This is the community's work. And in many ways, this is also the work of someone we like to mention, someone who really taught us a lot, uh, uh, another, a psychologist named Jerry Mohat. Um, and uh, about a little over 20 years ago to this day, uh, we were invited to uh, uh, initiate some work with Alaska Native communities by like a grassroots group of people who were just, uh, had just attended an NIH conference on alcohol and American Indians and Alaska Natives, they were appalled. They felt uh, the conference was stigmatized, it was characterized by one-way conversation. The researchers told the Native people about themselves. And it was very pathology focused. As uh, the late Cookie Rose told me, I hadn't had a drink for 30 years, and I felt like, well, I was going to have a drink. <laughs> and uh, they were very explicit. We want to study this, but we want to study sobriety, because most of the people we know live a life that way. And we wrote our first article about this called Unheard Alaska. And it was about the strengths and the resilience of Native communities. And that's what this work is about is about strengths. It's, it's a strengths-based approach to building reasons for life. And that, that's the community of literature. That's community engagement. That um, the second thing I wanted to do is uh, uh, I was really delighted and honored to see someone's joining us from Italy. I want to say, hey, David. Hope you're well. <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for dialing in. Too bad we're uh, missing you, but uh, some other time. Um, we're really honored. Hey, Jim. And, uh, <laughs> the, honor is, the honor is mine. Thank you very much. Uh, and I'm glad I got this invitation. And here's a shout out uh, from Missoula, but actually from uh, Spoleto, Italy at the moment, where it's uh, eight hours later and the sun is going down. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and uh, oh, the last thing I wanted to mention is the last thing you all want is for us to be talking at you for 90 minutes. So we really want this to be a conversation. We've had conversations with many of you already. We've learned so much. And uh, this can be so much better if you ask questions, stop us if, to explain something that you're unfamiliar with or you want to talk a little bit more about, or to talk about your own work experiences and how it may be relevant. You may have an idea about an area where we're stuck right now and it can be really helpful to us. Back over to whoever's good. We haven't rears this. Who's going to talk next? <laughs> well, I like that Jim started with the last bullet point, so we can kind of work our way back, <laughs> back up. So yes, yeah, so we can, that one's done. But we would really like this to be more interactive. So like the pause, or again, just, yeah, just jump in with your own experiences. Um, we, we're going to cover, I think, three broad areas of our work, or broad three specific areas of this broader work. Um, we are going to start, well first we're going to just do a quick overview of Alaska, because I kind of realized in my conversations <laughs> yesterday that maybe it might be good just to do a quick orientation to the state of Alaska, a very diverse place, so we'll start with that. We're just going to, we're going to touch on some of the um, health inequities and issues that Alaska Native people in particular face, just touch on that. Then we're going to move into um, describing uh, the, uh, I, the UPIC model that guides not just our preventive intervention or the activities with young people, it guides our research. Um, and that's why it's really important, we felt, to start with an expl explanation of the Puzzik model. Now, we had a video that we're going to show you from our online, um, it's our online toolkit, our resource um, that describes the, the approach, but it sounds like we might have some technical difficulties. So um, luckily we have 
pretty much, if you would have heard Billy on the video talking about the Kazakh model, but we got him in real life. So again, really amazing <laughs> you brought him here. So he can, we can do that. We can take you through the Kazakh model. Um, and then just, you know, maybe you can go check out that resource on your own. Um, and again, we want to uh, then highlight the Kazakh, the toolkit um, that contains uh, examples of activities that you that communities do to build protection um, and, and to really build protective childhood experiences. You're going to see a running theme throughout this conversation around how communities instructed us really in their approach to, to build the strength and to build up from their ancestral uh, their ancestral strengths and their historical strengths. And there, yes, you know, there's there is clear and evident um, uh, trauma and loss and mm -hmm. that has happened and, and, and communities are well aware of that, but they felt there again, people, first of all, before we could even get there and having them understand, they needed to first understand what originally made everyone, you know, so harmonious, like so able to survive such extreme conditions in the Arctic. Um, and those survival skills can still protect them. Today, they're facing new dangers and threats. So we've got to show them that. And, you know, yes, we do have, you know, we have a real problem with our children facing trauma and adversity in their childhood. We need to give them more protective experiences in childhood. Um, that's what we want to do. So you'll see all the different, you know, some examples of how, how we did that. And uh, early on in our work, we were uh, describing what we wanted to do in a community that law has asked us to identify the community. We typically don't do this in work, yeah. but by tribal resolution, this community is very proud of its work and wanted to be identified. And so very early in our work, we were describing what we wanted to do to elders, tribal council members, and the community of Olakana. We're talking about this thing called primary prevention or universal prevention. One of the elders said, what you're describing is what my elders talked about in terms of what you do to raise a child. And um, this is our approach. It's, they, they were doing preventative medicine way before American medicine. That's right. Okay. And uh, it, it's really, that's the cultural frame. It's not to focus on pathology, not to focus on uh, difference that's negative. It's instead to find the strengths, nourish, and nurture them. And those were those were those were our marching orders as well. This is this is the approach to intervention the community wanted to see. And finally, we'll touch on um, results from the research. This is, I think. This is a pretty unique. Um, this is a pretty unique model, particularly in terms of this being, I think, probably one of the longest-running National Institutes of Health-funded uh, CBPR projects, so community-based participatory research project. Um, I think it's also one of the only examples within the NIH portfolio of um, Alaska Native American Indian, uh, but an indigenous, uh, indigenously developed inter intervention. And, and evidence based as well as their emerging evidence based uh, practice that that's comes from the communities, Alaska communities. Um, so for since that 1989, so almost 20 years of, of NIH funding um, has led us where we are today. We'll go over that briefly, that history, and look at some of the data that's that's come out of the work, and and then you know we can have be interested in having a discussion around you know the experiences that we've had in, in the Ubik communities just the transformations we've seen and how how now communities think about research and how we think about research and ourselves as researchers and you know i i you know personally i myself you know, was real skeptical um that research was going could be life-saving you know and i was in again billy's community as a doing clinical work and i thought that you know i wanted to of my life my life's work there, but you know, it, it's it's. You know, I've seen I've seen directly how research can um, truly impact young people's lives in very healing and helpful ways. It's just kind of, again, I think it's it's because though our research is grounded in a UBIC process and in a community process, it's it's 
it's not just even guidance driven by it. Um, and so. Which is why the Cossack model is so important yeah. to understand. Um, if I just add, uh, you know, um, in the introduction here, it's saying that I was on the tribal council, the city council, and, you know, various boards and commissions at the local level and at the state level. And, at the, uh, uh, and I've seen projects come and go with good intention. It'd be there for a year for prevention and inter for, for intervention, and the money would run out and they would go. And the following year, or there'd be a gap in between, and the two years later, somebody else with it, you know, funding would come in with a new idea, the funding runs out, and, it, and they go away. So it's been going on for a long time in our communities. Yeah. So, um, when I saw this, I think we shared it. Well, we've tried so many things new. Why don't we try something old? <laughs> oh. <laughs> so, but but yeah, I mean, it's it's been our commitment. We keep saying to communities, we're going to be different. This isn't going to be. We have tried really hard. Well, you don't have to try as hard to be different. <laughs> <laughs> so Alaska, it's it's big, it's super diverse in terms of languages, um, cultures, ways of life. Of course, though, there's a, you know all the connections as well. As we to talk about. It's all related. Um, but we're going to be speaking specifically about the Central Yukon region, like this part, Yukon Plateau from Delta region of Alaska, and just to give perspective. So I live in Fairbanks, which is like right around here. So, so when I travel out to Billy's community of Imaha, which is right there, okay. So I have to go, like I have to go down to Anchorage, over to Nassau, up to Imanic, and it takes about 12 to 15 hours <laughs> to do that. So when I go home from Fairbanks to down to Seattle and then drive to Billingham, Washington, that takes me on a good day. I can get there in like five and a half, six hours. So just to give you perspective, this is a really big state. The Central Yukon region, uh, actually the Yukon Tuscan region right here is about, well, we're, we're debating this. It's either the size of the state of Nebraska, you know, one of those, but it's, it's a big giant region. There are 56 communities in um, really Charles the service region. Uh, there are no roads. There are no roads, you take little planes, or you take a boat to get between villages, or you go by a snow machine. Um, I don't know what they call them in that kind of, you call them ski you call them snowmobiles. snowmobiles. Okay, <laughs> so, um, yeah, so there's, so it's big. <laughs> and it's the other thing is that um, Billy's region is part of um, the Inuit speaking and so that's really fundamentally different. So in our state, we talk about, you know, these communities, I'll talk about as well as proud Eskimos. And there's the India, there's the Athabascan, Gritchen, Tinka Haida Sinchin, you know, and so there's a fundamental difference, you know, linguistically, culturally, but um, yeah, in, in a lot of different ways. So just wanted to point that out because I think um, not everyone always knows that nowadays. Is there anything else you really need to say? Oh, yeah. So, and again, we don't like to, we don't like to dwell like Jim was talking about on, on the problem focus or put one, you know, put one perspective of Alaska Native people out, but, um, but, you know, it's, it's definitely a problem and our state has, uh, you know, really experienced, you know, this, Absolutely shift. Oh, okay. So since about the 19, what do you say, 1960s? You, oh, you want to? Yeah, yeah. So this, this, this speaks legions to why suicide, why suicide in Alaska. Um, before uh, the 1960s, uh, we know, we know, suicide was virtually non-existent. And here's part of the reason we know about this. People say, well, we didn't have epidemiological data. Well, we did by 1970. And uh, 
The rate of suicide in 1970 was real low. Um, but between 1970 to 1975, we observed something different than the data previously, which was also level. The rate of suicide doubled. And then from 1975 to 1980, the rate of Alaska Native suicide doubled again. From 1980 to 1985, it doubled again. And at that point, by 1985, it was the highest in the United States. And, it's, and there were massive prevention efforts. It stabilized. It went up a little bit. And it's essentially stabilized from that point. It hasn't continued to rise. Um, the other tragedy of this is that it was essentially all the increase had to do with youth suicide and overwhelmingly male. I think that's a, a, a good segue into pointing out, and this is some of our more recent epidemiological data from the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium Center that the CTRP here is partnering with ANTHC on this um, work. Uh, but most recent data does show that, that there is there are differences in our state around prevalence um, for suicide. There are some regions that experience um, similar rates as our state average, some a little bit below, some we just have, still have pretty <laughs> missing data for. Um, but even within, and what this doesn't show, so it does show that um, Billy's region, the Yukon Custom region, is a, among the three, one of three regions that have experienced our highest, our highest rates um, continually over the years. And, um, and again, he, these are the three uh, like remotest regions of, of our state. Um, there are also the regions with, um, I didn't mention, I would say, with the, uh, some of our strongest uh, retention, things like language and subsistence way of life. Billy lives, uh, Billy's communities live around a subsistence cycle, really focused on salmon, of course, the keystone species, but seal and whale, and Billy, I like to use seal your spiritual species. But, um, we'll be talking more about that when we look at some of the activities that we engage, that communities are engaging youth within. Um, so we also see, so within this region, we see these amazing strengths, along with, you know, um, uh, the vulnerabilities. Um, and uh, so it's important though, even within these regions, because you can't see this here, even within the high risk regions, there are differences between communities. Like some of the people we've already talked to about the fact that there are 56 villages in the Yukon Cuscoquan region, about 8 to 12 make up really for the, the disparities. Um, that's where we say, probably more on the 12, I would say, side, just personally from what we, who we work with. But, um, so it's important, and, and if you know, we won't have time to talk about it, we do have a new study, our, the Anchor, the Collaborative Hub, will be looking in a systematic way at the differences in the community level factors that may be contributing to those differences between communities. So, and probably we'll do this and then we'll want to pause and see if there's questions. But what we'd like to do is to first talk about um, the physic model. And so it may be really what we can do is talk about when we first, about now 10 years ago, we picked the work back up and really started together to focus on the work. Um, so like Jim had talked about, we can name some communities, some communities for in part of a research project, we don't, but the uh, community of Alucana, um, that you're gonna, we're gonna be talking about this community. And actually on that map, remember where I pointed where Billy's community is? Alucana is just nine miles. Is it down the river? Away, over the Yeah, so about nine miles uh, away from Imak. And I would look, when I lived in Imak, we just, you know, we, well, we go by snow machine all the time. It only takes like 20 minutes by snow machine to, to get to Alucana. Um, and Alakanak, um, gosh, I was uh, in my clinical work there in 2002, 2002, so about 2005. And in that period of time, um, there had already been two suicides of two young men. And, and then when I left two years later, there were about six more while I was there. And then there were a sort of total of 11, just eight. So, there, so, I mean, essentially, it would have been probably you know, the equivalent. This is a community of, what, 600? 650 people, 
Um, and there were 11 suicides of young people. There was one this would be the equivalent of if half the class of the Missoula High School had and would have taken the class. I was out there like, Why, where is the national news? You know, what's going on? You know, and I, I was just, I will tell you, I was so out of my depth. You know, even though I, you know, I, you know, I, I lived and had lots of experience on a reservation and I'd seen, you know, I had seen things, you know, this was not, but I had not seen anything like this and um and didn't feel with my newly minted master's in community psychology um degree that i was working towards licensure and i had no idea how i was going to address this the community was looking at me to do something you know and i just remember the tribal administrator of Alekanek, who later became one of our key leaders of this project you know he looked at me and he did he said i just it was more he wasn't really a question for me it was just more of a statement of what is going on with our and I realized that, well, so I might have some tools in my toolkit to be able to help answer that question that communities really were asking. And, you know, we're starting to work on that question. Um, and so uh, that, was, that was in 2002. And then, um, so I, I went back and with Dr. Jerry Mohat helped, assisted with writing the first, what would be many, many grants <laughs> that were focused on working with communities in that region. And one did that in Alekana first. And then another community took sick bay and they took their sick bay. They started after, uh, had a different trajectory. We'll talk about that at the reception maybe, but Alekanak um, started then. When I, I went on to finish my dissertation and, um, and do other work, I came back to this work when it started in a five-year prevention trial when Alekanak had um, gone through and developed their strategies and the first version of the Knazovic, which I have, was put out, and they were having a lot of great success. And we moved into a prevention trial to work with Imanic and two other communities. Um, and then I took it back on <laughs> and immediately hired Billy, realizing we really were going to need some strong help because there's been turnover of the leadership of the project that time. Um, and then Billy and I were trying to figure out, okay, what were the essential ingredients? And we were trying to think about the, yeah, doing this work in, in Emonic because once again, even though it might, it, you know, we had all these great ideas in the grant of what we we're gonna do next, but communities nine miles apart can be very, very, very different. <laughs> and so it can't be just like, okay, well, let's take this, what Alekanuk did and plunk it over here in Emonic, particularly since they have a history of being kind of rivals in a good way, <laughs> but you know, they compete with their song and that, like, you know, and so, to say, hey, a luck and I did this, and you should do it. It was just a whole different scene, and I was really, we were struggling to figure out how to make this work. Um, until, until Billy, do you want to talk about when you started looking at the Knazovic and understood sure. what it was going to <clears throat> Let's go and I'll start off with uh, what you mentioned about a lot of the yeah. two communities being rivals, and uh, there's a Yupik term for that. It means, in uh, 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 means, uh, in one in one way, it means opponents, and in another way, it means yin and yang. You can't work without one another. And these are song and dance that we the ceremonies that we do in the middle of winter. That you know we invite one, and the uh, visitors will view the host, and they could be critical of them to make sure song and dance and the ceremonies are, uh, are done uh, properly. So we cannot do with the one that we in the <laughs> um, But because uh, when, uh, when we teamed up, I looked at the uh, finished product uh, the book and uh, I looked at the process that they took in um, doing the practical exercises that need, you know, these are practical exercises in the book uh, on the tool that you make uh, that you're going to be using on the land today. And we talked about the education, how education is just a, a cliff sometimes. We teach them, we teach them from the 12th grade all the way to the high school, and from there they just kind of drop. You know, I don't know how to find the wood and, you know, trap the beaver or hunt the seal. I'd be really interested. So, um, I looked at those uh, modules as uh, a puzzle, and uh, I'll talk about the puzzle model 
I think this is kind of a, a, a drawing of the last Qadrit in the community, and that last Qadrit in the community was in my community. It's a Qadrit is a communal place. Qadrit comes from the word Qasuvaqtaq. Qasuvaqtaq means in circle, and can also mean complete. So everything is done in the Qadrit. In the communal place. This is where the young man is being taught the, uh, 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 um, how to make the tools, how to survive. And they and uh, these people for hundreds of years, you know, they have that early childhood development. They're, they, they're scientists, they're psychologists, and they live through this harsh environment for many years using this process. Practical tools inside the closet for the young men. They leave the women out, this whole more women here than men. Uh, they were, you know, the women were outside, and the only time these are knit, and the only time the child would be introduced to the closet is when the woman thought he was ready. So, there's science behind that as well. And uh, we know this communal process uh, was different, even though we were you know, six miles apart, we cannot in impose on another community, this is the way you're gonna take care of your people. And they in turn cannot say to us, this is the way, at the time of those, uh, Suicide. I was the president of the tribal council, and I did not know what was going on on the community, even though I wanted to reach out. It had to come from the community. The elders said, no matter how close we are, our way and teachings and our knowledge might be the same, but the way we do things are a little bit different. So, and I, I think that's something that we from the Kazakh model. And um, what Billy was pointing out was the traditional organization of a Yupik community. So when Alakanak, when they first got together as a community to address the, the youth suicide issue, they said, okay, we have we never heard of a young person um, dying by suicide when when the elders, this is you know, the elders talked and they and they met. And, you know, they didn't jump right into to do to doing something or doing the activities. They took gosh, like a year and a half, a year and a half of meeting together. Oh, you want to make that? Oh, yeah. So, uh, maybe we would we'll capture that next one. With we'll the inside of it. Yeah. yeah, I was just trying oh, to. Oh, okay. So these are historical. These are redrawn. Edward Curtis went out to Hooper Bay uh, to Camila. Uh, Camila went out to communities way back then. And actually, there are aerial shots of what Yupa communities look like. And so the, the organization around the men's house, the Fezzi Camino house. Um, and so, an elder said, it's because, you know, one of the reasons is that, you know, our communities have become kind of decentered, kind of fragmented and disorganized. And we lost our center. We literally, with our physical structure, lost the center of our communities. We have to recenter ourselves. We have to put, like, and that's when he said it, Pudzik is not circling. We have to re -circling. Did you want this one? Or do you want the one uh, with the drums and the writing? Yeah, maybe on the next slide. Okay. So, and you'll talk about. Okay. Uh, the fragmentation, or you know, we kind of work in silos anymore. The makeup of our communities today uh, is um, the churches, the clinics, the schools. <laughs> but, uh, it's a little bit different than the lower 48. The lower 48, you have this BIA and this different departments, right? And they're all kind of working in silos, I assume. Mm -hmm. no. And uh, <laughs> well, in the community, you know. It's the same way, but in Alaska, you know, we have the schools, the village corporations, and we want to uh, do like the lower 48s and start to uh, reorganize our tribes within the city. So there was a city and a tribe and, uh, in silos and working in silos. So, so it's pretty fragmented. I mean, you know, and one of the things that our elders said when, um, and these suicides were happening in the community, uh, that they thought there was 
step back a little bit. When they first met, they said, oh my goodness, I thought, you know, we weren't related anymore. I thought our concerns were not were different because we hadn't met in a long time. So that's a risk factor too, when the elders will not come together or they don't have the access to come together anymore. You know, that's a risk factor. So the community, the elders came together, and uh, that, that's how uh, the healing started. But understanding that, and I, when we did the trial in, the month, I, in my community, I thought the organizations need to come together. And uh, the, uh, for the protection of the child, for the sake of the child, we need to come together and try and address not only suicide, no, because it's not going to address, we're not going to do this model and just focus on suicide or alcohol, but the, uh, Grant's focus was on uh, suicide and alcohol. We had to focus on something. But this is a holistic process. And while we're doing this process, we're not, we haven't mentioned suicide or alcohol issues. There's many other disparities and you know, character building in young people. We did this together. And, Every one of these, the churches, the clinic, the school, the village, the city, the tribe, the tribe nonprofit, the health corporation, these are regional. We all have the same goal, the concerns. And how can we bring this together? In partnership with the school districts and the university. I mean, in our community, like Stacy said, we were the most uh, economic and challenged uh, uh, region in the nation. We have to prove ourselves. We have to, in some regions, you know, have more resources than others. We don't. We have to prove our elders. <clears throat> I'm sorry. We have to prove our elders through science that they are the answer. That's why um, research is so important. And moving on, you know, while we're doing activities, you know, there's uh, different uh, protective factors. Like I said, the uh, elders, I mean, uh, the uh, uh, elders have missed out the science. So when you give you something to do, their mind is open. It's not it's not, it's just focused on something so you become a SpongeBob. You just absorb <laughs> a lot of things, and, so, you know. And uh, they cut it down to sleep. So we're doing practical uh, tool exercise and tool making. The tools that you're going to use today. I was talking about the education, how it becomes a cliff at the end. I learned that this morning. It becomes a cliff <laughs> at the end. <laughs> yeah. And um, so, we're making practical tools in an activity. And in an activity, we have these protective factors, the protective factors that you all have grown up with. And like I said, the old, uh, my elders and my father said, no matter where you go in the world, you're going to find relatives. Relatives in you know, this way, and relatives in teaching. Those protective factors, love, respect. And all those things that keep a community together are being taught by those practical tools and exercises that are being made. And sometimes uh, two elders would lecture inside the puzzle, bouncing up one another. And they get so deep, it's not focused on alcohol abuse or <laughs> drug abuse. <laughs> it's, it's holistic. And when the two elders are bouncing up one another, uh, things are happening, you might come close to me. It, it, it's, home, it's, it's home. It's not directed at me, but it's for everybody in the community inside the building. So that way it becomes personal, and you're the ones that can make that change. Not the guy that's lecturing. <laughs> so uh, I'm moving. Yeah, you for a second. Yeah. <laughs> Man around for a second and, and let you pick off. I, I, I think. Many of you, I'm, I'm repeating 
what we see as obvious, but I think it's worth emphasizing. Uh, as you're listening to Billy talk, it becomes clear to be one of the reasons approaches in the past haven't been effective is it's spoken to the wrong knowledge system. It hasn't spoken to local knowledge. It hasn't used local knowledge. And uh, one of the problems about imposing an off-the-shelf intervention from lower 48 to a tribal community in Alaska, and I would assert to a tribal community here in Montana, is, is just that. It's, it's, it's ignoring these elements of organizational process meaning how are things done in the community? How, does, how is the community traditionally organized? How do you talk to a young person? You know, do you yell at them about not drinking? Or, or traditionally, Billy's described a different way. And it's not, it's not just feathers and the, con that the, the pictures in the intervention materials. But what Billy is describing is a Pasiak model of intervening, a, a, a way of working with the community. And if we want to be effective, if we want to do science, we have to follow the local model. And we haven't been very good at that as scientists, as Western scientists. We've been focused on our methodology, and we've been insisted we had to follow that instead of really uh, adapting the approach to the community's approach. And uh, we're so dependent now. I mean, I think we may have been made dependent. I don't know if it was intentional or not, but I don't think it was for, you know, uh, I like to think positive, maybe unintentionally, you know, that for the outlook of these poor people, we need to make new housing, new schools, and educate them so that, you know, uh, they become uh, self sustaining even though we were self-sustaining from the neighbors. But um, we become dependent on their education, and dependent on their food, and dependent on their food, and you know, and uh, aside from that, we're, we, what's that term? Um, but, uh, uh, there's independence, the dependency and uh, Independent, independent, no, no, no. Dependency and entitlement. Mm -hmm. We're entitled to this. We're entitled to that. You know, we're free. We're, we need free education. We did this to us, so we need free this. We need that. free education, free health. You know, we're we're entitled. We've been, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, suppressed so long, and we're mad all the time. I'm going to speak for myself because this is my passion. <laughs> since I was growing up. And so we've been dependent on that for a long time. Until we go through this process and recognizing our values and you know and and doing the positive model by peace and be tough by people that truly love us. We become independent. We're out there up to see you and uh, someone said that I was a a good seal hunter, none, I don't think so. <laughs> but at least, uh, you know, I'm able to go out there and hunt and catch the seal if I, you know, and I know where to go because I know the terrain, I know the environment, and you know, these are things that I was taught when I was growing up. Uh, I know the wood, different types of wood, the different types of ice, different tools I need to use on the ice, and I can survive out there as well. Um, and only then can I see the value in the rest of my community, the interdependence, the importance of working together. So, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and we, so, I, yeah, I don't know, but I just want to find out there's, so we use this and we develop, I mean, the communities had the, the, their system, and really this is portraying a system of care that is quick. And, um, but when we're writing grants, so one of the first, so Billy was talking with her, Billy likes to draw, and Billy drew. <laughs> Billy was trying to draw this whole thing out of one chart, and I was just looking at that, looking at it as like, oh my gosh, I'm always needing a hero, that's a heuristic, <laughs> you know, that I can just stick, oh, that'll be great in a grant application, 
to describe our theory-driven intervention implementation process, which we have to do. And usually, though, that theory means your Western, you know, your evidence-based theory that comes from, you know, not UFIT culture. So we we have created, um, you know. We create this model for many purposes. This one we use with you know kids, as you can see, it can engage kids in relearning about you know their system and their project. But we also use it in our grant applications as you know a theory of change, a conceptual model um, that's UFIC. So really, yeah. then we need to roll. But yeah, <laughs> and I, I think uh, this is a, a really important point for really keeping an understanding both as a scientist and as a grant writer. And you just really wonderfully heard Stacy translate between the vocabularies. And, uh, and could you back up just yeah. for a second? And it's really easy to misunderstand these things. We have included sort of English language equivalents um, for these things. So Billy has described through this idea of moving from dependence to independence to interdependence, a multi-level model for intervention. And we can translate it as family, individual, and community levels. It misses something, doesn't it? Similarly, the protective factors, these are really culturally grounded. We have them in English, but they actually have UPIC terms. And the UPIC terms and the UPIC vocabulary is really a fuller expression of the meaning. It truly is an indigenous theory. And there's some which we don't have time to go into, but it's one of the central ideas of in the intervention is this idea of schlonic, which really doesn't have an English translation. It's one of those fascinating words you really know is gold in terms of cultural understanding because it's really, really untranslatable into English. But um, it is the UPIC vocabulary. This is, these are UPIC concepts that are driving the intervention and the theory of change in the intervention. Yes. Would you say that this uh, Kazakh model, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, Kazakh, um, <laughs> would you say that this approach is generalizable to all the first populations across Alaska? Why don't you answer? Oh, my goodness, you know, we uh, understand the basic principles that tie us together. You do uh, uh, practical <laughs> exercise in your community where I cannot. Uh, you know, impose on your community to make a sphere, this scientific way of measuring the size and spirit that you're going to be making in your community that might be different than mine. So these practical tools that make you survive or uh, 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 gathering of fruits in your area can be positive. And, you know, those activities in your community, uh, all you would have to do is include these protective factors while you're doing an activity. I like to say, just don't do an activity, just to do an activity, do it for a reason. I think, yeah, it's applicable, and I believe it's applicable in any way that you could tailor to the community We can maybe give an example of that, the model in action, by showing a couple of the activities, and that's how we do that. Um, but I'll just jet through this. I just want to point out, this is just right outside of the on the ninth day. Where all the photos are from part of the intervention activities. So, um, so we wanted to, because again, it looks like video is not going to be possible, um, but we, we did want to at least point everyone to the, um, the online resource. And maybe we can probably have written, is there a whiteboard in here? Maybe, oh, maybe we can write the website down on the whiteboard. It's in the front cover of the room, but that'd be awesome. Jim can do it. Oh, so, okay. So there's, so there are two online resources that you can go check out and then real thought specifically. So this is, the preview version of the Pemesovic, um, which started out in a big giant book that describes, you know, first there's, you know, the process of just the community coming together. There's the physic process that happens before any activity with young people takes place. This is probably the hardest, like when we, well, it's not the hardest. It, 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 well, it, it's hard when you're in a community and young people are dying. It's hard to not want to jump out 
immediately, you know, get young people like, let's go make spheres right now. But see, <laughs> again, when we looked back at where we saw the strongest effects with the young people, it was in the community of Alakanak, where they took a very, you know, they took a very well hard and focused approach to we work as a community, we get our strengths together as a community first. We have to be strong first for our young people. We work together first, then we work with young people. And so that's a first like a year process. And then, then you get to go and you're, you're selecting all your activities. You're choosing how your, your teachings and how you're going to teach protective factors within the activities. It's not doing an activity, just do an activity. Go ahead. Uh, when you do a, a initial gathering, a community planning group meeting, um, and you picked out an activity, then you would pick out oh, who's good at that activity. You know, who's good at spear making? Who's good at the best community? And that way you're including different members of the community to be the experts. Yeah. Or according to the tenets of community intervention, you find local expertise to deliver the intervention. You identify it. And then as part of that process, you identify the protective factors, the underlying strengths, and the underlying cultural values that will be taught. That that's why you're not doing the activity just for the just for the heck of it for doing the activity. We find out just the gathering of the elders is healthy. Sometimes you know we don't have that accessibility. You know, there's some barriers. You know people with this program don't bring the elders together. So if you go check out um, the preview on my resource, I would really encourage you to watch the forensic model video. That's we're going to try and show that. I think it gets a real concise. And it gets a historical piece that really it shows what the um, UBA physics look like. It takes you through the historical process of how they were expanded by missionaries and other forces that come into the region um, that impose other kinds of housing and social, social structures, and how communities today are trying to reclaim um, Aboriginal systems. So I highly recommend that. Um, I just want. Yeah. I, I don't know if you remember this, Billy. Once I was going on a, a harangue about the epidemiology, uh, about the rise of suicide in the communities, and Billy, you just noted, oh, that day, that's when the Cassia closed in. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I, I just want to point out an interesting feature because I think this is a cool discussion point we could have. So the reason we have a preview version, and you can request the full version, which has all, I think, 36 um, activities that you could with. You can request this version, but right now, the communities are in a sustainability phase for the intervention. We can't fund the intervention with research grants forever, and we've been, you know, when do we have, we've got some SAMHSA funding, and it have, have moved the Kanazovic, which is on uh, the Emerging, emerging Evidence-Based Practices, Site at SAMHSA, but there's a whole bunch of stuff going on there, and you know, EVP. Anyway, but there's um, so there's our we have a sustainability plan in place with communities where we're working to have the communities which who, they own this, this is theirs. The university cannot and, and is you know, not going to run this, um, and so we're working to now with the communities to develop um, a cooperative among their six communities that have now had you know gone through and implemented their own version of the commencement. We're trying to get a cooperative together who, that could, um, again, be a training resource and site. So we're looking at, you know, again, not, I get really, this gets sensitive, right? But talk about sustainability is sensitive. We're not trying to market this and sell. That's not what this is about, but how to, but, but, you know, how to allow communities to be able to continue their own work because it does take some resources. We can talk about what this costs because we've done some work around that. Um, and it's, by the way, not a lot. Certainly not what it costs to send out psychologists and clinicians as itinerants out to a region. region. Not at all. But yet, it does take some funding. Um, so how are communities going to be able to continue that funding once the grants are over? So, um, so we're putting together training, a training plan and all this good stuff. So I just want to <coughs> But going back, I'll go back to our presentation just to talk about the activity example. But, um, So here we were going to show a, a video on a winter survival activity that I still want to talk about because I think that that's still kind of important. Um, but these give examples of 
two different activities that are in the Kana Civic um, that teach uh, protective actors in different ways with young people. Um, and so, Jim, why don't you, you love talking about the ice, the ice pickaxe, you just love it. <laughs> I'll Thank you. <laughs> okay, you do the sea, I'll do the ice. I'll be the ice man. Okay. Um, there's a picture in your lap, top hand corner that I, I really kind of love. It's a young man holding uh, in his right hand and a yarok, which is a tool. It goes back in the millennium. It um, um, has a point at one end hook on the other, and, uh, and the, um, the point is to test the quality of the ice as you walk out on the ice, because uh, the, ice, the ice in Billy's home is the highway in the winter. It's the fastest way to get to the next community. But the Yukon River, uh, the, 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 you know, uh, there's current, there, there's good ice, there's bad ice. And then in the spring, when the ice stops, starts to melt, that's a really nice time of year to travel. It's a nice time of year to be on the ice, but the ice becomes even more stable. So uh, um, the, uh, the, the first time this was put on was a magical experience for me because an elder just took everybody out on the ice and started pointing colors out and teaching young people how to read ice. Started pointing out texture of ice and granularity. I, of course, was very fascinated by uh, the teachings and the knowledge, which was a level of science I didn't know anything about. I was also even more impressed by the realization of these young people all of a sudden realizing the wisdom that was before them all this time that they didn't know about. And before their eyes, these older people in the community who they really hadn't had an opportunity to get to know uh, emerged as very wise, very knowledgeable with essentially life and death knowledge that they wanted to share with the other. And, and it was a sea of epiphanies in young eyes to, to, to witness this. So this young man is carrying an yarrick on the other side of the yarrick as a hook. Because if you do blow it and you do walk on thin ice and you fall through, you can use that hook to pull yourself out. It's a tool that's, uh, that you should have at all times out on the ice. Well, what is that? Symbolically. It's a symbol of the intervention, a symbol of protection. It's a symbol of your culture, of looking out over you. And so young people do these in this activity. I happen to really like this, this photo because if you look carefully at his left hand, what is he doing? <laughs> you can't really quite see it. But, oh, there it is. He's doing this one. Okay. Um, he's like, He's a 21st century Yupik. He's, he's bridging two worlds. He's, you know, he's doing it. And uh, um, I, I think that picture really, that's the outcome from the intervention, right? And uh, so the protective factors, one is to learn through how to watch the ice, how to be safe on the ice is, uh, well, self-efficacy, but more importantly, communal mastery. You learn a form of mastery, and this is really culturally, uh, this is really culturally based. You, you, you solve problems by getting together other people in your community who you trust, and you work together with them. Right? You don't on your own try to solve everything. I mean, it's communally solved. It's it's mastery by joining with others. You have that experience of learning with the group and learning from your elders, and then. Um, there is this concept which I mentioned earlier, which might be translated as awareness. Uh, literally, the translation is to awaken. Uh, I woke up. And it's a developmental model. It's what you grow into adulthood to get in, in the Yupik cosmology. It's about being aware 
of your place in the world and your interconnection with others, with the natural world, with uh, the spirit world. It moves back and forward in time. It's a form of awareness and it's important on the ice. It's where you want to be. And on uh, the first time this was delivered as a module, I watched the elder patiently talk about these things on the ice, not saying, look at the granules and see how those are, are sharp and broken up. That's bad ice. Instead, say, I want you to look at that ice and see how it's different than the other ice. I want you to, you know, and everyone would look, and he wouldn't tell them these things. They would look on their own. And it, was, it was fascinating to me as a, as a Western pedagogue. And then he brought them inside in the Cassia again after the intervention. And he talked about, you know, this what we learned on the ice. You might want to think about that next time you get invited to go to a drinking party. And you might want to think about this all in the same way. You might want to do that. And, and the elder gave the young people protection. And a new way of thinking about the world and themselves and, and a different approach. That's how it works. That's how that one works. <laughs> <laughs> But I think, yeah, okay. I have my brother, and he works at the university and has been home for about 10 years. And he goes home every once in a while. Uh, he went home one time and it's towards spring. He was going to go out on a snow machine to the next week to visit the sister. And he was going to go alone and he was kind of uncertain about himself. I didn't say anything. I took my eye out and put it on the snow machine, and the confidence built up. He knew what he was for. He knew that I cared for him, that you know, and that you know, he, he felt safe. So, I'll think about And the, the ice safety activity, you touched on it at the end there. Usually, you do a little more on the, the translation piece. Um, you know, this we're funded right now by the National Institute of Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, <laughs> um, so NIAAA. And we are often asked by our program officer, particularly when we're asked to present at NAH. And <laughs> <laughs> We're not all that much. This doesn't fit really within the walls of an age real well, but um, <laughs> so, but when we are, they're like, what does this have to do with alcohol? Make this about the alcohol, like, you know, talk about, but you know, and, and, but that's the thing though, is believe me, I don't know if you've tried to like talk to kids about drinking and when you start talking about drinking to them, like, you know, it just, <laughs> so you know that you can't, you know, so these activities, they're, again, they're just like totally Greek genius, um, mm -hmm. indigenous genius, because, you know, they, they are talking about alcohol, and they're talking about um, ice safety, and they're talking about rotten ice, and yes, they do, I, I, I have watched as things are made so brilliantly explicit about things like the dangers of drinking, um, and also, you know, protecting yourself against suicide or thoughts of suicide. Um, so with ice age activity, yep, I've definitely heard them say, look, this rotten ice, it, it's, it's not just out here on the, like, out here on the rivers, the ice. it's in our village. You know, everyone knows those brew houses, you know where to stay away, but when you get on, you know, that, well, first stay away from that rotten ice, you know, um, and these are tools that can protect you across, and, you know, that symbology. Yeah, at least the 30s, a lot of times, alcohol and drug use with it, or symptoms of something, they're all looking for love. Yeah. And that is the symbol of love and also the symbol of someone that's watching you. There's a higher power. So when we did this in uh, one community, they took it to heart so deeply that they pulled out the public building. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And okay. they remembered the value. I just wanted to touch on really quick the seal hunt run um, because I, I just want to touch on the spirituality aspect of this work because Jim pointed out that yeah this is a multi-level intervention again this is a fun translation of <laughs> between the science terms or NIH terms the community terms and but there's a level that's missing on the physics model and those little models we make and 
Um, and it's a spiritual level, you know, so we're looking at protective factors of community, individual, family, and of course it's all go together. But we, we actually do, and we do look at um, spirituality, although I think it's a domain that we struggle with, like really showing the impacts on building up the spirits of young people. But um, in, in Alakanak in particular, that, that was another key part of what the elders did that first year when they closed it together. They kind of diagnosed HPK, right? And they used their own <laughs> diagnostic system. When they said, what's going on with young people? How to answer that question? They didn't really look at internally. Like, okay, youth must be depressed. Yeah, well, we might <laughs> translate all that. I mean, they didn't go there at all. It, they, they said, what clearly, you know, our community at a community level, our community is, is there's a spiritual sickness. There's a, there's, there's a spirit in this community of suicide. And that's infecting our youth. So this external force that's, you know, causing that internal, you know, disruption and, and, um, and so really the work of the community was casting out the spirit of suicide. And they talked about it that way. And they did a ritual where they did, you know, stomped and laughed it out of the community, shamed it out of the community. Um, but how spiritually, um, just, <laughs> just fundamental the work is, was at least to, you know, to me, represented really well the spirit, the, the seal hunt activity that we did. And we don't call it a seal hunt. Like, I don't think I called you a good seal hunter. I said, you are a seal hunter, right? <laughs> 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 so, but, um, we don't, we don't call it a seal hunt activity. It's like a go check around, like go vote, because you're not supposed to name, because the seal's going to hear you, and they're going to hide from the people and all of that. So they're just right there, because that connection between humans and the animals, it's a very personal, very deep, very spiritual connection. So two young people got their first seal, and it was like 25 young boys are up there. And um, one of the, and we had two young men as instructors, because um, the elders, it's hard for them to get around by boat and everything. We're all going back to this <laughs> access and elders, you know. So, but we had two young men out there um, as boat drivers and instructors. And so one of the young men remembered um, what his dad, who had passed, had told him to do, which was give a seal a drink of water. Um, that way, because you're gonna, they're gonna put the head back in the river, and that way it'll be, it'll have the energy, it'll be able to swim back home, and come back the next year. And so all the young boys were just so excited to line up and give the seal a drink of water. But after like, <laughs> about after five or six, I don't know if they just wanted to go home. But no, actually, the other young instructor, he stepped forward. And he's like, oh, ho, ho, ho. like that's enough. You never want to drink too much. You never, and you never want to drink too much water because that just fills up your stomach. And actually, that is true. Kids, young. People are not allowed to drink a lot of water, uh, but but he he went over to you. Just never want to drink too much of anything because you know your stomach's going to fill up. You're going to get heavy. You're going to sink. You know you're not going to you're not going to come back. So that was to me, and everyone was like, yeah, you know. Then they started talking about alcohol and drinking and things. And it was just so. May I just you you missed a you missed a little point of the story oh, you Jim. should tell. And <laughs> 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 this is it's why like, you you work the two elders meet together <laughs> so that they make sure everything gets out. You may you may know this, but in case in case not, um, the hunter doesn't get the seal. The seal oh, yeah, gives the seal. gives her himself oh, up to the hunter. And so by offering water to the seal, you're showing respect and giving thanks for the seal's gift to you. And you're also providing nourishment to the seal on the seal's journey back to the spirit. Mm -hmm. And if you do not do that and show respect, and Billy will correct me because now he's listening and it's two of us and I want to make sure he's right. <laughs> and if, if you do not show respect, the seal next year, the seal may not give her himself up to you. Uh, Stacy just reminded me he was, he was saying 23 young men or kids were out there. Um, it all goes back to the, how fragmented the organizations are, and some of our families are like that too. We forget to help one another, so some of uh, us are, you know, don't have that privilege of going out on sea hunt all the time. And we get to bring our relatives and our family out there because we become so independent, I mean, not silo, we become competitive anymore. So I just want to bring that up. But with this program, we're bringing people and connecting the young people with the uh, uh, instructors and the authority. We're bringing that community. 
And so I hope that in some ways answers whether or not it's translatable and that it's not, because the other thing is it's not about what the activity is. Mm -hmm. It's about what's taught, it's about the process of, of doing the activity and putting that together. So that was my, that was our 35 minute answer to your question. <laughs> 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 About the time that Jim left UM to go on internship, uh, I got a job as an evaluator for, uh, it was a, a kind of an intern job from UM as a graduate student to do the evaluation of the, the statewide uh, substance abuse prevention program in Montana. This is about 1990. And at that time, and this kind of connects to a number of things that you've been talking about, at that time that was run by an anthropologist. And his model of the problem was, that alcohol and substance abuse was a rite of passage in anthropological terms. And it seems to me a lot of what you're talking about has that flavor to it, that one of the reasons in a community you cannot help a young person on that rite of passage is you don't know what those rights are in a particular community. And so whether it's the seal hunter or the ice war, it depends on who the elders are, what they have to teach, but also how people move into that. And so I'm just kind of wondering if that strikes, uh, if, if, if that's a, a real connection to your work and a way of thinking about that. And, and I haven't put it together until now that that rite of passage is passage into the adult world, is that connection is the adult world and the adults who are there. I'm sorry, at the cliff. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. uh, you know, even that, I think, is kind of being watered down anymore and not understood, but we'd like to bring that back again. I mean, we just have uh, young people at the right age to introduce them to their first song and dance and present their name to the other community in the spiritual in the spiritual way. But now it's you know they're getting younger and younger and kind of uh, the, uh, the the spirit of song and dance is not just what it used to be when I was born. But even later than that he could tell me my age, but you know, when my younger uh, sister was, you know, her first dance was from the same school. Well, it seems like the, colli the collision with the Western intervention and mindset is around emancipation. We think about emancipation going into independence, but not really making the corner, turning the corner to interdependence, right. which is essential to what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. But no, actually the community identified, so we do have an age range, but so we talk like we, we it's a universal, like Jeff said, it's a universal intervention. Um, it's open to the community at, at, at large, although some activities are not. Some activities, you know, the community wanted us to focus on 12 year olds to 18 year olds. And I think again, a lot of it was around that, that key, the rites of passage, that real key transition mm -hmm. <laughs> period of discovering who you are as a contributor and meaningful member of your family and community. So yeah, you're right. So I think this is an excellent example of community-based participatory research. My question is, what about the evaluation? Yeah. How was success defined and who got to define it? Okay, here we go. <laughs> so we're gonna do that in question. three minutes. <laughs> yes, so we, we tend to favor talking about the intervention, but um, so, the community evaluate. I mean, we we work together with the community. We, like I said, our research was was driven by the community. They wanted us to look at if we were increasing protect protection in youth. So Jim Allen in particular has been our fearless leader in um, helping develop measurement tools that yes might be based on a, on a Western process where we can quantify some of these results by looking at a change over time using really complex biostatistical you know, statistical modeling um, that you can talk about. We, we had to develop all the measures that we used to look at you know, changes in young people in terms of protection at the community level, family level, at the individual level. So we have a whole battery of measures we give, self-report measures, and computer, and we need social network analysis now. But I'll give you, what slide do you want, Jim, to talk about? Like which slide? Yeah, uh, I will this. say we, do this through multiple modalities and multiple levels. So I'll talk about one approach we, we asked elders, and I'll talk about 
Then I'll talk about the approach about what we, what we described to NIH and state and federal policy. So the elders was very, you were very involved in that. You know, we interviewed elders about the changes they saw in response to the intervention. There, in one sentence, about some very complex observations, they observed young people now display greater respect. That was their own. What we did is, uh, this is a multi-level intervention at a community, family, and individual level. Uh, uh, they're called intermediate or proximal variables. So those are like change variables where you're trying to boost protection on each of those levels. This is uh, something we did very early on was to show that these predicted outcomes of uh, reasons for sobriety and reasons for life. This is a path analytic model. The question you get at is really interesting, and it's beguiled prevention research since its inception. It's like, how do you provide scientific proof and evidence of the counterfactual that you prevented something, that something didn't occur? How do you, and then beyond that, something didn't occur that was probabilistically based to possibly occur. So what we do, there are, two ways, there are two approaches of it. One is you identify risk factors and reduce them. We are not interested in that approach. We take the strengths-based approach. We're looking at identifying protective factors theoretically linked to the outcomes of interest, and we grow those. And so we're looking for growth and protective factors over time in response to intervention. Right. Um, we're not even going to talk about no, this. Way, about this is like uh, the design. How about the comparative? Yeah, yeah. And so this is some preliminary data. We looked at two communities where early on there was a low uh, intensity of intervention at that time in their work in the prevention program. Second community, which um, had a higher intensity of intervention defined as delivery of more modules to the youth. This is a summary of a pretty complex HLM model. We look at pre-existing level of protection. We look at a number of structural community variables. And um, we look at time and by community overall. And here's a very interesting, Jim, um, 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 uh, this is some work at um, McGill University, and uh, uh, they developed a statistical technique called functional data analysis. And this is looking at, um, I'll take one. This is looking at essentially creating a latent variable over time of reasons for life based on our measures. And this just shows over time the dark line is, uh, is reasons for life as compared to the broken up line. Um, the convergence on the end is the result of over time. Uh, uh, it's a statistical artifact because of few observations at the end of the intervention. Because people, because of respect for the autonomy of the individual, youth can join in in the intervention at any time. So we have rolling, uh, rolling uh, engagement in the intervention. And what you see is in the community, um, this is this is adjusted for pre-existing level of protection in a number of programs. What you see is at the start, the community that had high intensity intervention, the youth actually had lower levels of protection, this quickly grew and maintained over the course of the intervention. Here's the other truth about preventative interventions or any intervention you do in public health. Um, these are all points of observation of our data measurements of the treatment group and the comparison group. And you see comparison group people who got a whole lot better. You see treatment group people who did not. That's, the, that's why I'm really interested now in subgroup analysis and these horse race comparisons of one group against another really obscure a lot of really the story of the intervention. So in our work now, we're really interested in who really benefits from this intervention. What our preliminary work suggests it is young people, young boys with low protection get the most out of the intervention. And that's really where we go. And uh, so- I didn't emphasize the boys, which is super, super important because if you look at the literature um, on interventions with American Indian and Alaska Native youth um, around substance abuse and, and there's been a lot more there than suicide. It's really tough to get 
get voice and get Amanda to come out. And a lot of that, a lot of the evidence we have is for girls. And so this this intervention in particular is so attractive. So um, among other things, this is very important. We're trying to crowdsource where, should, where we should go for dinner tonight. So we're in the reception. We want recommendations. I'm sorry. So we have been totally greedy, but that's a good thing. And sometimes, sometimes we're told that you know we, we needed to share that. That was. But are there any other? The last question, please. What are the, I just want to say, I don't know when you want to do this, but you know, oh, okay. the outcomes of, uh, you know, these intervention and practical exercises out in the field are not going to come right away. We tell, or, or the elders would tell us, I'm telling you now, because I love you. It's not, a, it's not a written thought. There's no relevance to the activity right now, because you might experience it later on. A prime example, last week, uh, one of ours. Right there. Oh, right there. Oh, <laughs> oh no, well, these are all used from Alec and I call this. This is Travis Isidore. Travis Isidore was part of the intervention in Alekanuk when it was just starting and he was really involved. He was here. He's, I think he's 20 years old here um, or 19. He was 13 when he started the intervention work. That he were, we were on our way back from another community that was starting this and the youth do training in the community. The youth talk about what they did and what their elders gave them. Um, Travis is lucky to be alive today. Um, he was, Billy was looking for him last week. For the communities, all the communities were looking yeah. for him for four days. So it's four, four communities, multi village, uh, actually five communities. Um, and on the fourth day, I told him that uh, I was kind of involved in the uh, uh, getting people out and at the Cooper Station. Uh, and on the fourth day, I said, you know, I hate to say this, but uh, we need to check those holes up there. And uh, that was something they uh, have heard a rumor. So, uh, so they canceled the, uh, the church, both the aerial and the chronicle, for reasons we don't know. But uh, the rumor turned out young, a rumor that uh, uh, they might have seen him in another community. It's not true. So we're back in square one. We'll be going look for the next day. The next day, early morning, uh, we got word that uh, Ed found him. He was out four days from prior to, and one of the activities was uh, survival uh, on land. And this is the harshest you know, uh, place you can be. He was out four days. Uh, and uh, he came out of it with uh, probably the lessons that uh, well, we, he told we me. Shared. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so he told me. So I called him. They didn't tell me that they were oh, because I was on another trip. And they, because, you know, he, he really is. Travis is like, you know, our, <laughs> he comes with me to DC and we play. But um, he told me when I called him and scolded him <laughs> about, but he ran out of gas and he was going from one community and he got kind of lost. We've gotten lost before, by the way, so it can happen to anyone your most skilled, like, you know. Um, but he stayed by a snow machine, which is a teaching. He dug a little shelter under the snow machine. And he said he learned that from the activity. <laughs> exactly. But he said he learned it from the activity. That it kind of stuck with him. And, you know, and he was really grateful for it. And anyway, he, he I asked if we could share that. That's all. So I guess we're going to go talk. I promise we'll stop talking. <laughs> so, um, hey, thank you, everybody. We've had great questions. Um, it's been, I've really learned a lot being here. Um, you've all really appreciated your hospitality. Hospitality. No, thank you, Merlin. And we look forward to talking to you next week. Thank you. <laughs> I do have two more copies of this. And we can show your yeah. video in 166, and oh. there's food also. So there's plenty of good cookies and artichokes and spinach dip and all sorts of good stuff in there. Thank you, Thank you guys. Thank you.